What would schooling look like for black students if they didn't have to walk hallways in straight, quiet lines like prison? What would schooling look like if educators centered the well-being of black students instead of school codes of conduct? A lot of what schooling does is, is to not affirm, is to make black children and black people and brown people feel inferior from the inception, right? We, we all, and we start this with just very young children in general, where we see them as full of deficits and focus on things they can't do, but it's even done to a further extreme with black children, right? Where they're not only a deficit, their whole family and their whole culture and their whole people are a deficit, right? So we have to address that. Black Lives Matter at school is a declaration that Black students deserve to be taught the truth and that their lives have value in our schools and that they can't just be cast aside and pushed out of schools by zero tolerance discipline. And uh, they need to be nurtured and supported rather than punished and pushed out. As a, as a black man, again, thinking critically, you know, so many of my friends have wound up in jail. You know, I, you know, I used to really, we used to really support each other you know, emotionally when we was going through hard times of, you know, really finding who we were. You know, it's hard to find, you know, who you are in a system that doesn't want to find you, period. They don't recognize us. It's not okay for some students to feel like they can and that they're able, and for other students to feel like they never will, for other people to question the worth of our children. The most truly radical tenet of Black Lives Matter at school may be the intentional space and time created for Black youth to be safe and experience peace. Black Lives Matter at School centers the humanity of our children, who all deserve to breathe, process, inquire, challenge, create, fail, experiment, envision, dream, and exist. You know, why, why don't we talk about black leaders, you know, because all I ever see is us being slaves, you know. Like, why don't you ever teach me to, you know, how we fought back, because I know my people are strong. Educators have to dismantle systems of oppression, systems that we influence daily. We have to be radically different from the missionary educator depicted in popular culture. It's just amazing to see this uprising of educators from coast to coast who are demanding an end to institutional racism in the public schools and really want to empower their students to change our society. And that's what these demands are doing. They're giving us a chance to fulfill what we want, you know, to empower us. Black youth deserve a chance to dream uninterrupted. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for, for joining us tonight. Um, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, I want to thank Haymarket and uh, the Justice Re, uh, the Re Justice Initiative for, for putting on this event. Uh, my name is Liliana Segura. I'm a reporter uh, at The Intercept. Um, covering the death penalty uh, and, and the, the broader uh, criminal legal system in this country. Um, before I introdu uh, introduce our, our panel, I wanted to just uh, say a few things uh, about this moment we find ourselves in. Um, I actually had some remarks I was planning to give um, 
Uh, but we're getting a bit of breaking news tonight that I think is very important to share with you all. First of all, I want to say that I just came, I just got back uh, this evening from, or this afternoon from Terre Haute, Indiana, which is where the federal uh, penitentiary is, where they uh, put people to death in the name of all of us, uh, where the federal government has, um, as of last night, killed eight men in the federal death chamber. Uh, last night, Orlando Hall uh, was executed, um, a black man uh, tried and sentenced by an all-white jury uh, in Texas um, in 1995. Uh, I was outside the prison um, across the street when some members of Mr. Hall's family um, came to, to to stand and 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 just look at at the penitentiary where their loved one was being put to death. And that image. Um, it shames me to say that it's not a new image. I have seen that before. A number of us have seen that before. Um, and tonight, as I join you for this event, um, I just can't tell you how angry I feel uh, because upon getting home uh, from this uh, truly uh, sad uh, event, um, I got a text message telling me that three additional men have been moved uh, to the what they call the death, the death range. Um, and in lieu of saying anything further of, uh, of my own, um, I wanted to just tell you that in the meantime, I received an email from a man I've been corresponding with on federal death row. Um, he had been describing to me what it was like to be having his final conversations with Orlando Hall before they took him to the death chamber. And I just wanted to share with you a little bit of what he wrote before we had this, this news uh, that three more people are, are facing execution before uh, the Trump administration leaves office. He wrote, I've been preoccupied with Orlando and the fear he had to have felt all day yesterday, even before night fell. I'm fascinated with fear, the way and the, the way and the why it manifests. Fear is that unpleasant emotion that arises when one senses impending danger or harm or some form of evil. Orlando had to have felt fear. There was no way of escaping that sense of impending danger. And he writes, anyway, I'm messaging you today simply because I feel this impending danger, this fear. And he went on to predict that there would be new death warrants that would be given either today or Monday. And then he describes how his spirit is all damned up. He says he hasn't cried yet for Orlando's execution, um, but that he feels the life draining effect of sadness and that unpleasant sense of impending danger. And he writes, I'm worried about myself. And then he goes on to say, this place is really affecting me. He describes one of his neighbors a few cells down. He yells every single day, many times a day, F this place. And if you ask him how he is, he always says another day in hell. Nowadays, he depresses me. And besides this, when the guards do rounds, their keys clang and that noise is all of a sudden jarring, piercing my ears, hurting my eardrums, causing me major turbulence. And this never used to bother me. So I wanted to share that because that's what's happening right now. Uh, and since he wrote me that email, um, they've they've received word that that three more of their neighbors um, are, are are heading to the death chamber um, uh, sometime probably in January. So this is um, this issue is incredibly real right now. Um, I'm still a little bit shaken, frankly, because this is you know this is what I was doing all day and all night uh, yesterday. Um, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to to share this time and space with you all um, and to, to be um, surrounded by pe like minded people who care about justice, who know the the, the, the racism, uh, the unfairness, um, everything that that is, has been ugly for years and generations about about uh, state imposed death, whether in the execution chamber or in the streets at the hands of police. Uh, so with that, I wanted to. Um, quickly introduce our, our, our panelists and, and, and then I'm gonna go ahead and, and kick off some, some questions. Um, I wanted to start by introducing uh, the Reeds. Um, Sandra Reed is the mother of Texas death row prisoner Rodney Reed. Uh, in the 23 years since her son was wrongly convicted, she has been a tireless advocate for justice for Rodney. Sandra served on the board of the campaign to end the death penalty for many years. Following the folding of the CEDP, Sandra and her family founded the Reed Justice Initiative to continue campaigning for Rodney and against the death penalty. Sandra currently serves as the president of uh, RJI. Uh, and next to her is, is Roderick Reed, her son and, and uh, Rodney Reed's younger brother. 
Roderick and his family have been fighting to prove Rodney's innocence and to free him for decades. Roderick is the vice president of a Read Justice Initiative. And the idea for Read Justice Initiative was born out of a series of conversations between Roderick and Rodney, during which Rodney encouraged Roderick to establish a collaborative to advocate for Rodney and people in similar situations, Rodney. So thank you both for being with us. Um, uh, next, I want to introduce Mark Clements. Um, Mark Clements is a Chicago police torture survivor. Uh, Mark was only 16 in 1981 when he was taken to Area 3 Violent Crime Unit where he was tortured to give a confession to a crime. Mark was one of uh, the state of Illinois' first uh, juveniles uh, sentenced to uh, natural life without parole in the state. Uh, he remained incarcerated for 28 years uh, before his conviction was overturned in 2009. That same year, he was hired as an administrator and organizer uh, with the campaign to end the death penalty and later served as a board member as well. Uh, Mark also helped establish the Illinois Fair Sentences of Youth through Northwestern University School of Law uh, while sitting on the board of the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. Uh, Mark also works with the Chicago Torture Justice Center um, as a learning fellow, working in many complex areas of trauma uh, and while attending uh, court hearings and in support of others that were taken to police stations across the city of Chicago and tortured by, by members of the Chicago Police Department. And finally, uh, Kianga Yamada Taylor. Uh, is a writer and speaker on black politics, social movements, and racial inequality in the United States. Uh, she's the author of From Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation, which won the Lannan Cultural Freedom Award for an especially notable book in 2016. She's also the editor of How We Get Free, Black Feminism, and the Akoma, he, I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong, um, River Collective, which, which won the Lambda uh, Literary Award for LGBTQ nonfiction in 2018. Her third or most recent book, uh, Race for Profit, How Banks and the Real Estate Industry Undermine Black Homeownership, published in 2019 by the University of North Carolina Press. And it was a finalist for a National Book Award for nonfiction and a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for History. Um, so thank you for bearing with me with those uh, bios. I think it's very important to uh, boast about your many accomplishments, all of you. Um, and I'm just thrilled uh, and honored uh, to be moderating this discussion. Uh, tonight. Um, so I wanted to kick it off actually with the reads um, because uh, today, tonight, th this date is actually a very important one on our calendar. Uh, and I wanted um, either Roderick or, or Sandra, I don't know how you'll split this up, but I wanted, I was hoping that you could start just by telling us the significance of this particular date, uh, what it represents, um, and also uh, what, what we uh, need to know about the, the latest um, status of, of Rodney's case. This date is very significant because um, one year ago, uh, after all the support from the world, uh, various religious leaders, stars and everything, and, and just everyday citizens uh, like everybody else uh, was fighting to uh, save my brother's life. And we got uh, that stay, we got that indefinite stay. And they gave us time to regroup, breathe a minute, and move forward and, and, and continue to fight. And um, right now, as we are going, uh, uh, the fight uh, stands with. Well, as of this morning, I talked with Rodney's lawyer. Uh, we learned yesterday that the hearing is going to be postponed and put back till, till May 17th instead of February 4th. That was a big disappointment, but I kind of expected it. I was hoping for the best, but I, uh, with the pandemic uh, affecting everyone, we have um, additional witnesses that should have been called that are now older and their health is fragile, more fragile. And with this pandemic, you know, it's hard to, it, it, it's not safe to just enter their homes. And, and so it makes it hard for the investigation. Um, but we are doing very well um, as to where we stand. Like I said, we were, we were very disappointed, but expected it due to this pandemic. So uh, right now we're in waiting for May 
17. And, and you know, I should have, I should have asked, I, I'm not sure, um, sometimes I assume everybody knows the facts of Rodney's case, uh, but, but, but for those who might be joining us who aren't as familiar, do you think you could give us uh, some of the basics? I know there's a lot of twists and turns with this case, but, but I think it's important that people understand what's at the heart of this case. First of all, um, he was incarcerated one year before trial. And during the pre-trials, uh, I was even called uh, to the stand to make uh, a statement that Rodney knew the girl and was uh, uh, affiliated with him. Uh, with her, affiliated with hers. But uh, that was a year before trial. And then when trial was about, when the day of trial, well, they made me a, pretend, a potential witness for the prosecution. So he was tried by an all-white jury, mother not able to, to attend the trial, uh, witnesses that should have been called was not called, evidence. and to and 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 evidence was covered and was hid, hidden, and um, we fought for many years, and we did have an evidentiary hearing. Of course, we lost, and I think it was due to the fact that the judge that wrongfully convicted Rodney, his daughter presided over all the, the uh, court of appeals. So that was a conflict of interest, uh, to have your daughter to reside over the convictions that you did, you know, the judge did. So we've been, fighting for so, so, so long and been denied, as you know, and, and uh, uh, dates set and then stay. That is a, that is a very hard uh, ordeal to go through. And in case everybody's wondering, Rodney was uh, convicted of rape and murder of Stacey Stites back in 1996. Um, <clears throat> and Stacey Stites is a white woman. Of course, my brother's black. Mm -hmm. And um, the, her fiancé was Jimmy Fennell, who is a police officer at the time. Those things should be known. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, uh, there was DNA at the crime scene implicating other police officers in this case, uh, proving that uh, they, they, they were there and, and, and they had something to do with the murder. All those things have yet to come out and yet to be unfold, but um, that's where we are right now. Um, you know, my brother has been convicted of a crime which he did not commit, and crimes have been committed against my brother in order to put him uh, on death row. And that compelled us to uh, fight for the ending of death, this death penalty, because I do know, and facts and findings have already exonerated him, so to say, you know? And uh, this truth has been out here for 23 years, but we must not forget that there are more Rodney Reeds, more <laughs> Reeds it's like us. And, and, and uh, we got to do something about it. And we have to stop that because what, to me, uh, how is it, we have the Ten Commandments, and thou shalt not kill. And how is it killing deter killing? It doesn't work. It does not work. And as far it. as this uh, death penalty, it's just a modern day lynching. You know, because the, the, the hangings, it was against the law. It was abolished. But they figured out a modern day. It has never stopped. The wrongful convictions have never stopped. You know, 
And so um, we do know that this death row or death penalty is wrong. And inhumane. At right and inhumane. Well, thank you both. And I just want to say, you know, the reads, it, it, it's, it, it's really can't be emphasized enough uh, how much you have fought on behalf of not just uh, men and women with innocence claims, but everybody, everybody facing execution. Um, and and, and um, Roderick was in Terre Haute not long ago. Uh, I saw you there uh, standing, standing up um, and joining abolitionists there. So thank you for being in the fight. Um, we'll have more to ask you and more to talk about, but I think you've given us a good segue to, to, to Mark, actually, um, and especially on this issue, the, the linking of, of policing, because, you know, crooked cops are at the heart of this case, of your case, um, and, 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 and policing is also, viol police violence is, is also at, at the root of, of, of Mark's story and, and activism. So Mark, you know, you experienced um, horrific brutality uh, at a time, you know, when you were very, very young. And then after doing all of this time in prison, which is its own kind of violence, you came out and you became a death penalty abolitionist. And that's how I met you uh, not long after you first came out. Um, you, you fought against the death penalty. And I just think um, no one can describe better than you uh, what connects your case to, to that broader uh, abolitionist fight. You're muted, Mark. You're good. Okay. Uh, welcome and, and thank you for this opportunity. And how could I not be an individual that leave a prison system and hear the compelling story that Sandra Reed first brought to me upon my first year of being released out of prison? I can't account for other brothers, but I can account for myself. Me being someone who only had a little old mother that fought for me, being someone that was given four natural life sentences, told that I would die behind a prison wall for corruption that thugs basically committed towards individuals that were black and brown individuals. The system, even to this day, uh, it reminds me of Rodney's situation. And it reminds me due to the fact that as much as the evidence is compelling, the system still goes into its nest of trying to cover up and to keep covered up something that is obvious. And, you know, we can lay the jokes aside, but this is a human being. And being a human being, I wasn't going to turn her down. And I came out with a heart for this woman. And I had the opportunity of meeting her children and having the opportunity of sitting on the porch. We sit on the porch and eat nuts and we talked. We talked about Rodney and we talked about really what went wrong with the criminal justice system. So I lost my mother. So people like Sandra is my mother. So I mean, uh, not call this lady in a long time, but she's always in my heart. And regardless if she see or not, I'm working. But we're dealing with a thug criminal justice system from the governor in the state of Texas, Greg Abbott, uh, to this prosecutor, uh, and I think his name is Getz, at, 
you know, this is corruption and corruption at its core, and the people must rise for Rodney Reed based off of the fact that integrity, integrity must matter. And when integrity don't matter with the criminal justice system, that's why we see that John Burge and all of his subordinates were able to get away with taking people like myself and over 200 other African Americans and Latinos down to police stations and chaining us to walls or other objects inside of the police station and dehumanizing us. That's what they did. I was only 16 and I try to get that point across to people. They took all of my adolescence from me. So now you release me back to this society. I'm 44 years of age when I did return. Now I'm almost 60 years old. My life. So let me tell you, my fight is for Sandra to be able to touch her son, to be able to smile with her son, and to be able to build that family relationship that was stolen from her and to hold these crooked officials in Bass Rock and the entire state of Texas accountable. Mark, before I move to Kianga, I wanted to follow up and ask you, you know, one one thing when I look back on 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 the time that has passed since I first met you um, and 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 where we find ourselves now as a country, um, it's kind of extraordinary. Uh, you know, the rise of Black Lives Matter as a movement uh, has been trans transformative. Uh, and I think it's brought in a whole new generation of activism uh, that at the time, I don't, I, you know, uh, we hadn't seen before. And I, and, and I, I've been thinking about you and, and, and the, some of the earlier days of Black Lives Matter, because it came around the time of the Troy Davis execution. And you were very uh, involved in that fight. And I was hoping you might be able to to remind folks a little bit about about Troy and also about that connection, because I remember there it was part of that kind of early energy. Um, uh, years ago? Well, Troy was a case that, I, you know, I really wanted to win it. You know, I wanted it to be a black individual standing there for his brother, knowing the pain and hell that Martina had to go through. This is a woman that survived at least 21 years dealing with cancer. I wanted to win it. I felt we could win it. And I'm not one to hold my tongue. It was just confusion. And confusion allows the enemy to work its number. But it was a great mobilization because when I went down to Georgia, to be honest, it was only a few people in a classroom. And we had to reach out to the University of Georgia and to Georgia State and, and to get them to link on to their friends and then to their buddies. That's one thing I like about when I go to Austin, I immediately hit the campus and I begin to at least identify who I am. Then I identify why I'm there. This is the thing that uh, it learned me from Troy situation. We, we had sleepouts in the middle of the street. And we're talking about what, 2010, 2011. And I'm being a person that is freshly out of the prison system. And it's, man, I wanted us to win this battle the same way that I say that innocence must matter and innocence must matter for Rodney Reed, I think that the spirit of Troy is in me and I'm going to speak that. I don't care about the officials in the state of Texas. I know that I am amongst enemies, but I am there due to the fact they already stole my life. 
So I'm going to be a voice and I'm going to stand because I love these people. I love them and I want them to understand that sometimes a yoking and a bringing can come clear across the world. I haven't given up on them. I'm not going to give up on Rodney. All the time I'm posting little things about Rodney on my Facebook and just trying to keep the people active due to the fact I want people to understand this. And I see that I have my comrade here. We need to feel last drop up. We need to do something for Rodney. These are mischievous animals who want to kill this man to cover up their malicious behavior of a torturous, murderous cop, Jimmy Cornell. So we, as African-American people, we're going to have to put the fire around the other races and we must bring them to Bastrop and jam those streets and let them know to, first of all, take down the racist symbols that they have in front of their courthouse. This stuff is a disrespect. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. It's uh, it's been a long fight, and I know you've been you've been there every step of the way. So thank you for sharing that. Um, it's powerful. Um, I and Kanga, you know, Mark. Actually, it's kind of a good moment to ask you, as somebody who covers social movements, um, as somebody who's written really powerfully about the George Floyd protests, about everything that's been happening um, in these past few months that feel so much longer. Um, I really wanted to ask you to speak to this moment we're in politically, and 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 especially, I mean, for all the for all the danger uh, we're facing around these election results that are not quite resolved. Uh, it, it, um, I was hoping that you could speak to a different kind of danger, which is that we have seen um, over the years how when a democratic administration comes in it can have a kind of deflating effect on social movements. Uh, we saw it under Obama with the anti-war movement, for example, um, in, in various ways. And, and you could speak better to that than I can, but I, but I wonder what you make of this moment where Biden is coming in, where we're gonna have Democrats back in office. Um, I'm curious what you think will happen to the energy around um, some of these protests we've seen, this upheaval that we've seen, um, and, and, and how we can ensure that, that um, these election results don't deflate the activist energy that's that's uh, so powerfully asserted itself uh, in these past months. Um, well, thank you, uh, Liliana. Uh, thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you to the Reeds. Um, I'm very glad to to be able to be um, here with all of you uh, uh, tonight at this very important meeting that is about trying to understand the moment that we're in, but most importantly, um, how to keep the pressure on uh, the state of Texas uh, to uh, stop this criminal act of uh, keeping Rodney Reed um, imprisoned uh, on uh, for a crime he didn't commit. And, you know, I think that uh, what the Reeds and Mark exemplify, which is important in this moment, um, is the meaning of solidarity um, and uh, the willingness and, and the necessity of not just fighting your own struggles, but linking them to other struggles, because that is exactly what is necessary um, for any of us to be able uh, to win um, right now, when we see the ways that uh, this deadly pandemic, um, the economic recession, uh, and the abject crisis and uh, racial injustice in the United States have come together in such a uh, violent, um, uh, bewildering, uh, and overwhelming way. Um, so that that's the the spirit with which um, I, you know, come in, into this meeting. Let me just say uh, first of all, in response to your. Uh, question. I wanted to say something about the impact of Troy Davis 
um, in the, his execution uh, in 2011. Troy Davis was also an innocent black man on death row um, in the state of Georgia. And I think that uh, for when we think about the Black Lives Matter movement today, uh, what some people may not uh, realize or may not have connected to or even understand um, the way that the execution of Troy Davis in 2011 um, was one of the catalysts, I believe, uh, for uh, what eventually wound into uh, a Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, in some ways, just as important as the murder of Trayvon Martin, um, Troy was executed uh, six months uh, or so prior to um, uh, the murder of, of Trayvon Martin. But what was important it, about that in terms of the development of consciousness in that moment was that it was a jolt to particularly young black people um, and activists who had voted for Obama uh, in 2008, um, who for this precise moment, people voted like they had never voted before um, for Barack Obama, so that at this moment, when this innocent black man whose case had generated an international campaign, or even someone like William Sessions, the former head of the FBI, said that Troy Davis was innocent. This was the moment that Barack Obama, that people expected Barack Obama to intervene. No one wanted to hear about, you know, the conflict between ex his executive power and the role of the states. No one wanted to hear about um, how complicated this would be for him to, uh, to involve himself. People wanted this black man who understood a constitutional scholar, right? A, a scholar of constitutional law in the United States to intervene to stop this illegal, immoral execution of Troy Davis. And not only, and so you had students from Howard University marching on the Supreme Court. You had a national mobilization of, of led by black students, but that drew in tens of thousands of people from around the country demanding justice for Troy Davis. And not only did Obama not act, but he acted as a coward when the next day he sent Jay Carney, who of course is now a spokesperson for Amazon, he sent Jay Carney out to address the press about uh, uh, anything but Troy Davis, who dismissed the protest, dismissed the anger and expectation uh, of, of people by simply saying that this was a, state's, uh, a matter of states' rights and that Obama had no jurisdiction over this case. And that was it. And so that was one of the moments where you could see the beginning of a radicalization um, of this group of people who had believed in uh, Obama's campaign. So we put the um, Occupy Wall Street, the execution uh, of Troy Davis, the, ex the murder of, of Trayvon Martin. All of these things are the building blocks to what eventually becomes the Black Lives Matter um, movement, which of course uh, we are now in the midst of the second wave of. Um, and so I think in terms of what it means to keep the pressure um, you know, on elected officials, you know, I think that some of this is about experience. I think that you know, 2011, was not a hundred years ago. And I think we're dealing with, uh, you know, act, with activists, but ordinary people um, who, for whom these betrayals are very recent and for whom their tolerance for the evasion, the lies, the pleas for more time, uh, for all of the antics that uh, the political class engage in 
uh, to avoid any responsibility um, or to avoid uh, um, the, the, asserting themselves in ways that their power allows them to, uh, to produce some of the demands that uh, our side wants. And so I think that very few people have any illusion um, that Joe Biden is a champion for justice. I mean, he spent last spring uh, and winter during the primaries having to defend his hideous record as an architect of uh, law and order um, in this country. As we know, as an author of the 1994 uh, crime bill, uh, but of even more consequence uh, as a mouthpiece for the kind of racist rhetoric um, that contributed to the demonization uh, of uh, young black people, of black men in particular, um, in this country that have been the prevailing politics over the last 25 or 30 years. Um, and so Joe Biden, that is his legacy and that is his history. And I think that because of that, and because this has been a focal point uh, for the movement in the same way that it became a focal point around Hillary Clinton's campaign in 2016, uh, that there'll be a, there, there, there won't be any honeymoon period. There won't be any period uh, in which people um, who have been connected to the long campaign, uh, uh, various campaigns to end capital punishment in the United States, people who have been in the campaigns and struggles against police abuse and violence, and people who are at the heart of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and I think that because of the protests since the murder of uh, George Floyd, um, that there is a deep appetite and hunger uh, for change to be very quickly uh, implemented. And so I think that uh, whatever idea that Biden has uh, or you know, that the Democratic Party has, that uh, there will be some time uh, for them to implement some kind of piecemeal reform um, that there won't be a lot of time. Because I think one of the reasons why people so quickly gravitated uh, to the demand of defunding the police is because we went through the piecemeal <laughs> reforms, right? In the, the immediate aftermath of uh, the first eruption uh, of the mass movement out of Ferguson, you know, where people kind of uh, oriented then on body cameras and presidential commissions, and, and, and people, you know, people invested in that and, and uh, uh, gave that an opportunity to be effective, and it failed, and it failed miserably. And we've been watching black people killed by police on video uh, for years since then. And so where piecemeal, uh, lackluster reforms fail, it opens up the pathway for more radical demands. Um, and I think that we're seeing, uh, that, we're seeing that now. And the, the last thing that I'll say is that part of sustaining that uh, argument and sustaining that vision for uh, a more just society comes through being organized, working together with you know, family members, with people who are directly impacted uh, uh, by this and engaging in the kinds of long-term struggles and campaigns that uh, everyone on this call has been on. So I think that, you know, we're, we're actually in a strong position um, to, to follow through on uh, trying to win these campaigns for a more just society. Thank you, Kanga. You know, it's, it's amazing to hear you trace, trace that evolution and share so much history that I, I I'd forgotten a lot of, 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 of what you shared. It's like I knew once upon a time and I've, and, and it's, it's amazing how much um, the Obama administration, it, 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 how much happened in spite of, 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 of who was in the White House. And, and, and you're right, those lessons have been uh, learned and, and I, I actually feel more optimistic now hearing you uh, put it out, put it out that way. And, and when I, when I need to remind myself on how far we've come, sort of uh, how far we've, uh, these movements, um, 
have transformed the kind of uh, parameters of debate. You know, I look at the death penalty and frankly, mm. Obama supported the death penalty. Obama never, uh, Obama took some positions during his administration and during, during the campaign where I, I, I know I was very personally disappointed, maybe not surprised because it's what I had come to expect from Democrats, but but he never really wavered from that. He didn't commute death row sentence, uh, you know, death penalty, uh, the, the sentences before he leave, uh, left. And then in 2016, you know, Hillary Clinton also uh, supported the death penalty. So it's sometimes I have to pinch myself because when I looked at this, uh, you know, for all the, the pain and struggle of the primaries, you know, we had a situation where all of the Democratic candidates and finally even Joe Biden uh, took the position that they were no longer, that they were mm -hmm. not support the death penalty. And I think that is a testament to the work that you all have done uh, f for so long. So I just wanted, I wanted to share that. And actually now looking at the time, I think we're at the point where we've got a slideshow and then I think we're going to play that and then we'll come back to discussion. I think we're going to try to see if there's questions um, from participants. Uh, so if we could tee up that that slideshow, um, and then we'll keep talking. I have a dream. One day, this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its dream. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created. I have a dream. Chubbs. I just wanna be free, is that too much to ask for? 18 years death row, the evidence ain't add up I'd probably take a bullet for this track, but it won't matter I stand for what's right, but to them it doesn't matter That's crazy, the people that swear to serve and protect Shoot you while your hands up and get vacation plus a check Or corrupt the whole case, just trying to put a man to death Bet they thought we'd give up and let them put that man to death Now, see together we stand and bite if we fall If you don't fight for what's right, then they gon' always do what's wrong History keep Repeating, we can't let this go on. I swear God don't like ugly, and y'all see what's going on. Half of the town in ashes, chief and sheriff left the force. You read what you sow, you thought God was telling jokes. Old dude doing 10, but he need death row. Screaming free, right to read till they let him out the door. Hold up. No justice and no peace. I can't sleep, I can't eat. Why do they do it this way? Something is going to change. But I just wanna be free No justice and no peace I can't sleep, I can't eat Why do they do this this way? Something's gonna change But I just wanna be free Ain't no justice, ain't no peace we gotta stand up for Rodney Reed, an innocent man on death row, charged for a murder, someone close. Hey, you never know, it's a picture and you will get framed with no peace. Look out, Obama save us from the date, March 5th. Lord, and it's your will, let it be done. Please send Miss Sandra home, her son, so she can hold on to him like a newborn. And God don't make no mistakes, so when he set free, just know it was G.O.D. who free Rodney Reed. 18 years of humbleness. Through God without one gray hair, yeah, your stress ain't fair. And I want a fair trial, that's all we asking for. So free Rodney Reed with a coke can smile. Free Rodney Reed with a coke can smile. No justice and no peace. I can't sleep, I can't eat. Why do they do this this way? Something is going to change. But I just want to be free. No justice and no peace. I can't sleep, I can't eat. But it is not perfect enough to continue to take innocent people's lives just to keep a killing machine. There are many men here today standing and marching in solidarity each and every year for this just cause. And we will continue to do it until it stops. What do we want? I have a dream. One day. So uh, we have a few questions uh, for speakers, and I, I want to make sure and leave enough time so that folks can can ask those. And 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 here's a good, I think a really critical one, um, especially when we're really struggling um, in, in moments like these. Um, I, I'm hoping everyone can address address this. Um, and the question is, what gives you hope? Uh, and what makes you cautious or concerned in your work? Um, and you all can take take that question and and um, and hopefully, you know we can just sort of go around and discuss. The truth, the 
truth. It's getting out the truth. And that gives me hope because it is the truth. And my son is in it. So uh, I am very optimistic. I have my trust in my Lord. And just uh, faith in, in God has sent me you guys. You know, people from all over the world. This is about truth and justice. You know, uh, we have not had any justice. You know, uh, since I've been in this, it makes you feel like the justice, they say, mean just us. You know, the justice system is, it makes you feel like it's, it's made to protect them, themselves. You know, it's just for them. Uh, and we need, uh, and, and the racism is never stopped. Uh, and the Jim Crow is still going, just undercover, you know. Um, what, what, what gives me hope is the fact that when we got into this, we, we felt that we were all alone. And then people stood up. People came together. Black Lily Hughes. And that made all the difference in the world. We, we, we stand on the truth because the truth remains the same yesterday and today and forever. Right. But we also are enthused and what gives us wings is everyday people like you getting involved and in signing the petitions. And, and having people from all over the world, uh, you know, there to support us, that gives us hope because we know that we're not alone now. Yeah. And, and we need everybody that's been uh, those well wishes, signing, uh, you know, uh, petitions, whatever they've done, we need them to continue to fight, not just to free Rodney Reed and get but justice for, for, yeah. but for everybody to, to abolish the death penalty. And I know together that we can do that mm -hmm. because together we, we stand, stand divided, divided we fall. fall. And so that gives us hope, our togetherness, our family, and we're all family because we all are child of God. That gives us hope. Mark Kanga, what gives you hope? You're muted. On or off? Good. Okay. Um, what gives me hope is watching people finally get a form of justice. And the reason I say a form because those years that these people lose in their lives, they'll never get back. But to just see a little old mother or a little old father or a child smile based off of the work that you have done is the biggest reward that you can ever get in this world here. Being locked up inside of a prison, being a kid who couldn't read nor write, that's what I was. I was strictly taught by the prison system. People liking me, and they said, guess what? We're going to help you. And I saw what a helping hand can do. Right through that, to where I ran into a young child by the name of Paula Cooper, that was one of my first cases as a paralegal in the law library, Miss Paula Cooper, who was 15 years of age, and she was so touching. And when we tell you, she had very, very, very wild ways. And to see over the course of time, her development to a fine young lady and an educational driven type person. That was my reward, is that I didn't stir her long and I stayed with her until the end. 
The bottom line of it is in this life, we only got one mother and we only got one father. And I would like to believe that if I was on death row and in the same situation that someone would reach out to me, if there wasn't a Marlene Martin with the campaign to end the death penalty and holding conventions in the city of Chicago, maybe I would be still locked up behind a cage. So joining the team with the campaign to end the death penalty and knowing that I was being paid by the people, not by the government, by the people, I didn't feel obligated to the politician. I felt obligated to them. And I am on this mission to remain, to bring her son home. That's what's going to give me hope. And that's all the reward I need in this life. Thank you. I'll just say really quickly that um, I think one of the uh, enduring features of uh, the Trump administration has obviously been uh, the racism and corruption uh, of this regime, but it's also been protest from, you know, the day before his inauguration, uh, the Women's March, where four million uh, people uh, assembled across the country. It's the largest demonstration in American history uh, to the protest uh, against Trump's racist Muslim ban uh, at airports, to the mobilization of uh, high school students at Parkland that sparked mobilizations across the uh, country against gun violence, um, uh, to the teacher rebellion uh, led by teachers in West Virginia, but igniting uh, teacher protests and strikes across the country. Um, the, the climate march, I mean, protest has been a, a feature, an ingrained feature of U.S. society um, for the last four years, culminating uh, with an uprising in the United States last June uh, against racist police abuse um, and violence, with the New York Times calculating that somewhere between 15 and 26 million people participated in thousands of protests against police uh, brutality across the country um, over the course of the, the, the summer the largest number of, of people involved um, in a, a, a protest movement uh, ever recorded. And so that is, you know, we learn from that the way that uh, ordinary people through their collective uh, 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 organizing and intervention into these political discussions can transform uh, the scope of what is being talked about can transform what the, the discussion about what is actually wrong uh, in this country, can force people like George W. Bush, the grim reaper of Texas who oversaw the execution of 154 uh, 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 people in that state during his reign as governor to say that there is systemic racism in the United States. And so that is the power of, of, of protest. And that is not going to go away just because, you know, some uh, 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 Democrat, Joe Biden, of all people, with his fake veneers and his fake smile, uh, come into office. And that's just supposed to go away. It's not going to go uh, away. And so that, for me, um, is the hope, not just of exposing the crimes of these people, um, but really showing uh, a path and a direction for how we change this entire arrangement in this country. Thank you. I just I, I was glad that that Mark brought up Apollo Cooper because I, I just wanted to say you know um, we recently in the abolitionist movement uh, lost Bill Pelkey, a man who uh, was a, a deeply tied to Paula Cooper um, a, and who I got to know very well over the past. Uh, year especially as we've been protesting these federal executions and 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 the reason I want to bring him up um well one to 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 talk about how we're grieving him um this was a man who taught me a lot about compassion about solidarity about uh standing up um against overwhelming odds um but also because he did 
he did something that 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 many would find inconceivable. It was his grandmother who who was murdered um, by a group of of girls, including Paula Cooper. And 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 the story that he told that I won't try to replicate is how he came to understand that. Uh, it, it wasn't justice for his grandmother uh, to, for, to have Paula Cooper on death row. Uh, and, 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 and he forged a connection and a friendship with her, not because the system ever facilitated it, but in spite of a system that fought hard to keep them apart. Um, and, and, and that story, if you all watching don't know that story, um, please, please look it up because it's an incredible, um, it's incredibly moving and it's been very sustaining for me and, and these days during the federal execution spree um, to have known uh, Bill Pelkey, to have known some of the folks that he worked with uh, with the Journey of Hope, uh, which is an organization um, founded by uh, uh, murder victims' families, uh, but also in, um, including uh, exonerated people, um, families of people on death row um, in prison. Um, and so so it's in that spirit of, of uh, uh, reaching across, uh, uh, finding allies in the unlikeliest places sometimes. Um, and, and, and something that I'll just share that uh, one of the, I think during when we were all standing, um, the day of the third execution, it was, there were three executions in a week in July and um, everyone was feeling quite exhausted, um, and they were, but they were doing their protests. And I remember walking up to Bill Pelkey and sort of saying hello. And, and he said, you know, he said, uh, sometimes all you can do is stand up uh, and say it's wrong. Um, and, and, and that stuck with me a lot because so, so many days I think I feel really overwhelmed. We feel really overwhelmed about what we're up against. And that certainly was true during the Trump administration. Um, but you show up anyway and Bill Pelkey showed up anyway and you all show up anyway and, 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 and stand in, and, um, in solidarity with one another and, and against these enormous um, uh, forces of state violence. So I just wanted to share that uh, since, since Mark brought up uh, Paula Cooper um, and I'll see if, if we have any other questions, but I, I wanted to kind of, uh, oh, go ahead. I would, I would love to be able to speak on Bill Pelkey, but Sarah Felt is a good friend of mine. I work with um, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, last time we were together was there uh, in Terre Haute. Uh, but Bill Pelkey was a great man, and he's going to be sorely missed. Uh, I got to know him very, very well, uh, especially uh, back in March when he invited me and my wife to come to Alaska to help uh, do some uh, protesting there, some rallies and, and stuff there. And he opened up his home to us, not just his home, but his heart, him and Kathy both. And he showed me the matter of man who he really was. And he wasn't a man of just words. He was a man of action. He he he, he talked to talk and he, and he walked to walk. And I just wanted to say that he will be sorely missed. He was a very great man. I just want to and I had the opportunity to briefly speak with him to also and to thank him for the work that he has done. Thank you. Thank you. Missing a giant in the movie. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to lose the second part of that question, which was, you know, I think the hope question is critical uh, in sustaining us um, going forward. Uh, I'm curious what, what you all, um, what makes you cautious, what you're sort of on guard for, what you're looking out for? Um, what do you think in this moment um, people need to sort of be aware and cautious about? I think that people need to be aware of that there is just evil people out there, people that don't want to see anybody have anything good. There are people out there that uh, are built on, on greed, thrives on, you know, just just plain out wrongness. But at the end of the day, I think that people need to be also be aware of that there is good. There's great people out there in all races and all fashions. And, and that is what we need to focus on. We need to keep our mind on positive because we can't have a positive life with a negative mind. We must have a positive mind to project a positive life, we must go forward and, 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 and put actions, not just into our thoughts, but into our words and actions. I would, I mean, I would just say that I think um, one of the, the, the biggest problems, um, one of them is 
the idea, I think, that activists and, you know, the left broadly conceived uh, helped to mobilize uh, people for this election. And now they just need to uh, give this new administration time uh, to come up with um, uh, its own reforms uh, to implement. Um, I think that we can already see that the efforts to kind of close ranks um, uh, in, during the campaign to uh, get Biden elected and to eject Trump from the White House uh, is unraveling very quickly, um, where uh, those in connection to um, the Biden administration um, uh, and his allies are, you know, attacking uh, the the most left or progressive uh, uh, layers within the Democratic Party, so the the so-called squad, um, but also the broader activist. Um, uh, communities, uh, you know, have come under uh, attack for uh, raising issues that are too divisive, like defund the police, um, are too outspoken, um, and, you know, should essentially go back to taking a, a back seat. And so I think there's danger in um, thinking that, uh, other people, especially those, again, who have had a history of acquiescing on uh, these questions of, um, you know, defending the criminal justice system, uh, there's, there's a danger in letting those people dictate the pace at which uh, reforms are organized and change uh, is, is called for. And so, um, you know, I think that people need to press on in the same ways that they've pressed on. I think they have to act uh, in the same ways that we have acted for the last four years in the face of a Trump administration with the same level of urgency. Thank you, Kangi, uh, Kanga. M Mark? Okay. Well, I think that um, my comrade is 100% correct. We are going to have to be very careful of these new rats that are going to enter the White House. And when we tell you, I know Trump was a great piece of work, but I do see a lot of watered down criminal justice reforms. Uh, I see, man, even where that uh, the prisons may prosper, I don't see the death penalty being abolished. And I don't see the crime package, which the Clinton administration stated that was signed under faulty data. He's never repealed the crime package. So if you know that it has affected African American and well, black and brown people at record numbers to create mass incarceration and to uh, basically keep people behind prisons for longer stints, then it would only be common sense to repeal that. If you if, if you want to be my friend, then you are going to repeal what you have used to paralyze us as a people. And, and that's what this package did. And then they come with the anti-terrorist law, which also had uh, reforms to basically strip appeals from death row inmates. So I don't support Biden. I did not support Trump. The key of it is I think that we are going to basically have to fight harder than ever. I think that uh, in the next few months, the police is going to basically, man, they're going to 
be killing us in the middle of the street. And the criminal justice system is going to cover it up like Barack Obama covered up the murder of Mike Brown and other murders. And when my comrade here uh, uh, released the fact of Obama releasing the statement about not wanting to get involved into uh, Tory Davis' situation, I think that was an eye opener right there. So we have been sold out because we keep putting the wrong people into the public office. And, and, and change looks like we're going to have to do something uh, that's going to bring change. And that means more people, more faces in these public offices. Thank you. Sorry, uh, um, you know, as as we start to 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 um, reach the end of our time, I didn't want to um, I didn't want to let COVID uh, let the pandemic go unmentioned. Um, I know that um, I've thought a lot about uh, in these last months how much this pandemic has exposed the lie of what we what uh, what Americans uh, often call. Uh, public safety, you know, the idea that prisons are public safety, that police are public safety, that any of this carceral architecture is in the name of so-called public safety, uh, when in fact the pandemic, uh, when it comes to executions, has exposed just how willing um, uh, the government is to to push through these um, cruel uh, ritualized murders, um, bringing people together from all over the country, uh, uh, doing everything that we know should not be done in the midst of a pandemic and 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 all in the name of so-called public safety. So so I wanted to uh, ask you all how, how the pandemic has, um, I guess, broadly speaking, uh, affected you, your work, but also maybe reframed the way you, you think of some of these things um, by also exposing um, the the myriad ways our, our, our systems um, are, are designed um, uh, to harm and, and, and do the opposite of, of keeping people safe. Well, um, the pandemic has has, has played a, a major event, a major role in how we, you know, uh, communicate and do our activism because I, I feel, you know, what we're doing here is a great job, but I. I feel live and in person, it, it, it is a lot better. It, 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 you, you get to feel vibe, the energy, and everything else. But despite the pandemic, uh, after uh, several months of being home and, and sitting back and doing these Zoom calls and, and different things, trying to continue movement, uh, I, I realize that uh, you know we had to get back to being out there on the ground, uh, just like, you know, um, Bill Pelke, you know, he's 76 years old and, and, and he was uh, commuting to DC. He was there with me at the Department of Justice. He was there at the uh, uh, White House with me. He was there, there in Terre Haute with me. And we masked up and we did what we did. We, we took precautions and we, we hit the ground. And, and, and people were warning us within our family, outside of our family, other activists, you know, uh, saying, why, why are you taking these chances on going out here? And, 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 but, and I always answer, you know, that, that there's a risk in everything you do, but you have to wear it out. And, and if we can get out there and make a difference by, by showing up boots on the ground, and I, I, I'm willing to take that chance because it is worth it in the end. Uh, the goal which we are trying to achieve. That's just not uh, to bring Rodney home, but to abolish the death penalty, to try to help change the way we are a people are being treated here in this country. And uh, by any means necessary, we're going to do that. We're always going to try to do it in the right way, the right fashion. But uh, we're not going to let nothing stop us, nothing hold us down. And speaking of that, here the next few months, the next rallies and stuff we're getting ready to hold for Rodney, we're going to do with boots on the ground. We're going to mask up. We're going to take all the precautions, but we're going to be on site and we're going to make it happen. Here, uh, We're not going to let that slow us down. You know? And, you know, it ain't for everybody, but I do know this is something that I and my family, we, we, we just have to do. 
Well, speaking with uh, Rodney's lawyer this morning, they're not even uh, allowed to even go in and visit their uh, clients. Uh, they can't even go in. So that uh, that this pandemic has really affected the, the cases, the, the system. Period. You know, everybody. And so, but there, he said that they were would uh, find a way. They were going to let him call. And I have talked with Rodney twice since the pandemic, but haven't seen him none this year. Once, yeah, since March, one time this year, and it's it's just hard. But uh, that this pandemic has really affected a lot. I mean, everybody. And, and, and I think the, the the administration is using it to uh, put a lot of people to death because they, they feel that people won't be boots on the ground. They feel that people won't show up in masses to protest. So they're taking advantage of this while everybody's locked up behind closed doors. They're sneaking in the night murdering people in their hole. You know what I mean? And, and, and that's crazy. You know, I think they're, 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 they're taking advantage of it, you know, trying to execute people right now when they feel our hands are tied. That's just my opinion. Thank you both. Kanga, Mark? Um, I'll, I'll just say that I, I think that since March um, and April that the pandemic has really um, highlighted or showcased the inequities in U.S. society in probably the most dramatic way uh, ever. Um, and I think that you know, this is what, how we can understand the larger context of the uprising in June, that, you know, typically the experiences of poor people, of working class people are hidden um, or ignored. And I think that all of the discussion about uh, so-called essential workers, um, about the disproportionate rate of death and illness uh, impacting black people um, and uh, of the really criminally insufficient response from the federal government uh, brought all of those contradictions that are typically buried um, to the surface. And, uh, you know, and that, that since the, the public murder of uh, George Floyd ignited all of that that had been uh, whipped up um, by the pandemic. And I think that what is different about this situation um, than what typically happens is that the pandemic makes it impossible to just turn the page and move on. Um, it is setting the pace of, of politics because uh, it continues to uh, ravage through the country in an unchecked way. And so all of those questions about inequality, all of those questions about who gets to work at home, who gets to uh, essentially isolate themselves to protect themselves from the virus, who gets access to health care, uh, who gets access to um, personal uh, protective equipment, all of those things that when boiled down point to um, the, the deep divisions between the haves and the have-nots in this country remain on the surface. Um, and it continues to be uh, a source of uh, anger. Um, uh, it continues to be uh, uh, at the heart of uh, politics. It's one of the reasons I think that, you know, the Democrats were successful in making this election a referendum on Trump. Um, but the failure to really uh, respond in any meaningful way about what they were going to do about uh, the the crises spawned by the pandemic uh, is why they failed down ballot um, is why they failed to flip the the, the, the Senate uh, and uh, actually end up losing house or seats in the um, House of, of Representatives and so um, you know this thing remains I think again at the at the heart of um, at the heart of politics, at the heart of everything that is happening uh, in the country um, right now. So, it, you know, it obviously makes it of, of critical importance. Oh, 
Okay. Okay. Well, I think that COVID-19 has served a death sentence upon a community of individuals that are confined. We are watching tons of people all across this globe behind the prison wall, and they are contracting COVID-19. Now, in some states, like Illinois, COVID-19 turned out to be very good. We had over 8,000 individuals released out of the prison system. Uh, many people that would not have received bonds, uh, at least I bonds, received I bonds. But now they have went back to the same practice. And we are seeing numbers that is in ranges of 10s and 12s and 13s and 14s and 15s, new cases per day, thousands. And it just goes to show you that this stuff is out of control. So COVID, I've been working from home through the city of Chicago for shoot, since May, I mean, since March. And we have no intentions of ever returning. We are making the city of Chicago find us a different location rather than in a medical location. Uh, it's a testing site for, for COVID. And, you know, just watching so many people behind the prison walls and listening to them and they are, you know, just basically explaining how they are being deprived of medical treatment, even more so. Uh, and how the administrators, it just basically, they don't care. So COVID-19, has turned out to be a death sentence for many prisoners uh, that are confined behind prison walls. And I'm pretty sure the numbers probably next week is going to start to rise inside of jails and prisons, uh, probably at record numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, I had hoped to end on a a slightly more hopeful note, and yet I, I feel like uh, our previous question about hope, about how we sustain ourselves and our movements, um, probably answered answered a lot of what we would have said. I um, I wanted to before we close just just mention that there's there's links. Um, we had a number of questions, and I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but a number of questions about what what people can do. People always want to know what they can do. Someone in Colorado was saying, "What can I do from Colorado?" And and if you haven't seen those of us watching, um, I believe in the in the in the chat, um, there are a number of links you can share and visit. Um, media links uh, there that you can donate to the Read Justice Initiative. Um, there are petitions to sign. Um, uh, based Facebook pages, Instagram. Um, I want to also stress you can write to Rodney um, uh, on death row. Uh, uh, it's it's so critical that um, incarcerated people and people on death row right now hear from hear from from us um, and and are reminded that we can see them and that we care um, and that we're there and in solidarity with them. So so I, I just wanted to thank each of you, um, Roderick, Sandra, Kanga, Mark. Um, it, it means a lot to me personally today to be sharing this space with you. Um, uh, thank you to everyone who joined us. Thank you to Haymarket. Um, uh, I um, yeah, I think we're gonna we're displaying um, some of those links that I mentioned. Um, uh, hopefully, you all can can see that. Um, but thank you so much. Um, the work continues, um, and I appreciate uh, each of you and everyone who's who's joined us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.